the February study session to order. Madam Clerk, could you call the roll? Yes, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Baer? Present. Commissioner Walls? Here. Commissioner Kennedy? Present. Commissioner Duckham? Commissioner Tompkins? Commissioner Mahoney? Present. Commissioner Williams? Present. Commissioner Elwell? Here. Chairman Chatwell? Here. Seven present. Arrived at the first opportunity for public com comment. Each individual will state their name and have three minutes to address the board. You may only address the board once under the public under this public comment opportunity and may not yield your time to others. Board members will not debate or answer questions at this time. Opportunity for public comment. Any public comment? Any public comment? Seeing none, move on to item four, approval of the January 7th study session. Entertain a motion. So moved. Support. We have a motion and support. <coughs> Any questions? Comments or corrections? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Duly carried. Item five. 2019 annual evaluation and 2020 budget, Lifeways Millage presentation. Mary Beth? Just give me a minute to pull up the presentation, if you will. Sure. Can you get it for me then? Thank you. Good, uh, good morning, commissioners. So what I would like to do today is to present on the uh, millage for 2019, kind of an evaluation of the use of the dollars uh, for 19 and the services that we were able to provide, and then uh, our uh, budget for uh, 2020 and what our intended uh, use for those dollars will be. And feel free as I'm moving along to ask questions. So just a reminder, when we looked at it uh, about a year ago, I presented the uh, planned usage for the budget uh, for fiscal year 19. Um, it did include uh, a lo the local match obligation, jail services, looking at enrichment services for the intellectually developmentally disabled population, also looking at mental health services to support the schools, the Jackson County guardianship services, as well as services, obviously, for those who are uninsured or underinsured who are showing up uh, at LifeWays. Um, and that is the budget there for a total budget of $2.1 uh, million, and that was um, the estimate for uh, uh, the revenue that would be generated from the millage in 19. First thing is to look at the number of individuals that were served relative to being uninsured or underinsured. Um, as you can imagine, when you look at this graph, uh, when we started the implementation, uh, we had to get the word out uh, relative to letting people know about the fact that they could receive services at LifeWays. And so you do see over the course of the year an increase. Um, a total of individuals that were served were uh, 302 uh, individuals who did not have um, insurance, who uh, came to LifeWays or did have insurance but did not have a mental health benefit. The next slide looks at um, the t types of services, the services total that were provided. So of those 302 individuals that showed up, how many services on a monthly basis were we able to provide? Um, and uh, for a total of uh, 1,670 services were provided during the course of the year uh, for individuals showing up. And the types of services range everywhere from psychiatric services to case management services, therapy, screening, crisis services, peer support, um, crisis residential, community living room. You can see that a wide variety of services were provided for individuals that um, came to LifeWays who were not insured. Mary Beth, can I ask Yes, you sure can. Okay. Yeah, let me go uh, back and move back a slide then. Yeah, probably two slides. So on the 2019 plan usage under 
mental health services for uninsured and underinsured. That's yes. what you were just talking about on the next slide. Yes. So 35 people essentially? No, 302 people were served. 302 people. Yes. So about $1,700 each is how much was spent on them then, ballpark? No, I didn't utilize all that. We haven't gotten to what the actual expenditures were. I'm sorry. So this is just showing you what we budgeted. Now I'm telling you what we actually did, okay. how many people we were able to serve. But you'll see a graph that will actually break out what was actually spent per line item. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Just curious uh, how those numbers for the underinsured and uninsured compared to 2018, how many were served for Zero. uninsured? Thank you. Yes. Because we didn't have the funds. Yes. Um, okay, so let's move on. I'm sorry. Uh, a little problem with the mouse here. There we go. So the, again, I just talked about the services that were provided. The next item uh, relative to what was budgeted for was really to look at, and I talked about this when we were pursuing the marriage, about the fact that individuals uh, who have intellectual developmental disabilities, that once they were turned aging out of the uh, intermediate school district, do not have the ability like the uh, mentally ill population to have social enrichment opportunities uh, paid for out of Medicaid. And one of the things that I clearly heard since becoming CEO was the struggles that parents have uh, with children that then age out that basically, and I, I shared data when we pursued the millage that spend their time at home. It was just alarming. Um, and the need for us to really look at being able to provide supports for uh, that population. Uh, we did um, issue an RFQ, an, uh, a proposal uh, back in uh, January. It did take some time to secure a provider. We, sele we selected Club Life. Um, and if you're at all interested, uh, they, they have a website and they also have a Facebook page and they are doing absolutely phenomenal things in the community and getting individuals with intellectual developmental disabilities out and engaged uh, with their peers and uh, attending things like any of the rest of us would. And here's just a list of some of the things that they've been able to do. Um, they serve about 90 uh, individuals and they've been able to provide over uh, 1,200 uh, services um, since uh, they began uh, in about June of this year. The other thing that we've been able to do is provide supports to the jails. Uh, we initially started off uh, with providing one uh, full-time mental health clinician uh, in the jail who covered both jails. And uh, the demand was so great uh, that mid-year we did add an additional full-time clinician. Uh, we've been able to serve 427 individuals this past year in the jail uh, and providing over uh, close to 1,200 services uh, mental health supports and anything from uh, crisis resolution to uh, uh, therapy uh, to help those individuals. Yes. Mary Beth, when police officers have a person they run into on a call or on the street and they take them, for instance, to Allegiance for uh, an evaluation, uh, perhaps a mental evaluation, is that something that is done at LifeWays during the day also? Officers could take a person there? They could them bring... Up? Yes, they could bring the person uh, there during the day at this point in time, yes. Is there any reason that could not happen at the jail instead? Mm. Bec because well, I mean, I think we could potentially, in my slide I'm going to be talking about plans for this next year for the use of the millage and really focusing on some crisis supports that are needed in the community, and that could be one in partnership with law enforcement. So one of the problems, just to state it, that we have or officers have is that uh, word gets out on the street that uh, you can manipulate the system and be, instead of taken to jail for whatever reason, you get taken to HFA for an evaluation. Uh, many times you end up getting cleared by the physician there and end up going to jail and it ties up an officer for sometimes an hour or longer. And it just made sense to me to have that done at the jail if possible. Um, so I thought I'd ask. Yeah, and if you if you don't mind, I would like to come back to that uh, question that you've raised right there when I get to the crisis services that are going to be fo a focus of this next year. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, the other thing that we did uh, this past year is really provide supports to uh, the schools around mental health services. Uh, it did take some time. Uh, there were a couple of uh, programs, uh, Club Life being one of them, this being another one that did not begin January 1st. So we did not expend uh, the amount of revenue that we thought we would initially because it took some time to get it up and going. Um, but we do have uh, two community engagement specialists, one at Springport, one at Forest Street Learning Center, in partnership with the ISD uh, for the schools that they identified at most risk uh, relative to mental health needs with students. And um, it is an ability for us to coordinate care and uh, do screenings and connecting them with mental health services uh, quickly. Um, the other thing that we've been able to do is to provide, which is a critical thing, is, you, you know, around education and prevention. And this past year, we've provided youth mental health first aid trainings and Safe Talk, which is a suicide training. And you can see there the number of trainings we provided and the number of people that have been trained. The other uh, thing that has been provided for our community around supports to schools and mental health needs is around trauma services. Um, so uh, th these are uh, therapy services that are provided for individuals that have been identified students that have experienced trauma. And uh, a list of the schools as well as the number of students and how many sessions have been provided this past year. Just a quick question, how you identified those particular districts? It was in a partnership with the Intermediate School District to, to identify the schools that they felt were most at risk relative to meeting mental health supports in the schools. Okay. They were at the table. I mean, we couldn't make that decision as the community mental health the ISD would. I guess my question is, does every district have the opportunity, um, were they approached by the ISD, to, to talk about students that might have uh, potential needs? Now that I, I couldn't answer that question, whether or not they approached the other schools. I know that we've met with the ISD and those were the ones that they identified. So, I mean, if it, there's a recommendation to uh, pursue that, I would absolutely be uh, open to doing that with, with the ISD. I'd, Talking about other schools. I would like to see East Jackson and Michigan Center at least have the opportunity. And Vandercook Lake. Thank you. I appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I, I, I hate to jump in there, but is there any way we can include any of the Jackson Public Schools as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Springport is, but okay. All right, let me move on to the next slide and I will take that back to the planning. Uh, this actually looks at this fa past fiscal year. So it looks at our initial budget um, relative to uh, where uh, we plan on utilizing the millage dollars and where we ended up. One of the things to note is we are not yet closed out of the fiscal year. Um, we do, there are still claims and billing that is coming in. There's still the 90-day uh, window. So this actually won't, the numbers won't be finalized um, because year end was uh, obviously December 31st. Um, so uh, some of the numbers will fluctuate a little bit, but I, I would say that a good majority of the claims are in. Um, but you can look at what was um, spent relative to uh, jail services um, for the enrichment center. I did note on this slide, if you will, because it does have an impact, was that some of these did not begin until July or fall. Um, so I did not have a full years of expenditure. Um, but one of the things that uh, I also uh, want you to note there on the end is that uh, there will be uh, 584,476 that will be a carryover, and that is to address the crisis services that I talked about and I'm going to talk about in a little bit further uh, for the community um, moving forward. So one of the things that we look on an annual basis, and when we pursued the marriage, we committed to the county that we would um, work in partnership to really look at 
what is really truly needed in the community around mental health and where are the gaps. And one of the things that we're noting, uh, and, and you kind of pointed to that, uh, Commissioner Elwell, is around the uh, challenges around inpatient. And, um, that there's not a lot of opportunities for diversions for people. Uh, after hours and on weekends, the only place that individuals can go is the emergency room. When we look at the utilization of uh, the number of screenings that we do, we do on average about 240 to 250 screenings a month of individuals in the ER. Uh, and um, we are only placing about f uh, uh, you can see the numbers here, about 114 if you were to look at December, um, a little over um, 44, 48% of individuals actually get placed. So there is an opportunity to divert those people from ever even going to the ER in the first place. They don't need that level of care. Um, we are having challenges as a statewide system around the fact that people are being boarded. And I believe I've talked uh, to your commissioners about that in the past, that people at times are sitting in our emergency room for up to two weeks as they are waiting for a bed somewhere in the state of Michigan. And the challenge with that is that uh, the state has seen a reduction in uh, inpatient psychiatric beds since about um, 2013. The number of beds have decreased significantly. Uh, for just for an example, children, there used to be 729 beds, and now there's about 279 beds available statewide. So we need to be able to offer alternatives for individuals who uh, can be treated safely in the community in a lesser intensive uh, placement than the emergency department. And when you think of the emergency department, the emergency department is really designed for individuals with physical health emergencies and not mental health emergencies. So I want to talk about our plans for this next upcoming year. Um, is really looking at, uh, like I talked about right now, it is confusing. There's two points of access during the day. You can come to LifeWays, um, but in the evening and on the weekends, uh, the ED is the only uh, alternative for individuals. When we look at the fact that um, 1,300 individuals this past year could have been served in a less intensive setting than the emergency department, and you look at the cost of the emergency department and being able to divert those costs um, on annual, that's about $3 million. Um, we already know that uh, it already puts an impact on an overloaded emergency department system within our community by having uh, uh, individuals with mental health needs uh, showing up there who could be diverted. And it is a duplication of assessment. When we look at the fact that individuals show up, they have to go through two screenings. They go through a screening uh, that occurs with the emergency department, and then they also have to go through another screening because it's a requirement of the mental health code that the community mental health for uninsured and for those that are the Medicaid population that we screen them. So they go through two screenings, the amount of time that individuals in the ED, there is a better way to provide services. So what we are uh, looking to do and we've been planning for for um, our strategic plan actually for the last four years is around the evolution of being able to play and provide 24 crisis services for all in the community. Um, the millage dollars will help support that, but will not support, it won't cover the cost for Medicaid, so that is important to note that Medicaid dollars will be able to be utilized to cover the cost for those that have that. Um, but this is really about the uninsured, the underinsured in our community, so that everybody, uh, you don't have to say, okay, I can only go to LifeWays if I have Medicaid or Health in Michigan. It has to be, no, it has to be open to all in the community. Um, it will allow for 24-7 crisis response. Uh, there will be walk-in availability. It will allow the ability for the hospitals to be able to transfer individuals. Uh, we already have a mobile crisis team in which we can dispatch and pick the individual up um, from the emergency department and bring them to LifeWays um, for uh, a level of care. We will have a continuum of crisis services at LifeWays. Uh, right now, we already do have the mobile crisis. Uh, we do um, also have an intensive crisis stabilization service um, that we were approved for with the state a little over a year ago, and that's specifically for children. And it's a dispatch mobile team that will go wherever that individual is in the community. They will, they, they can be called to go to the school, to the home, uh, provide the supports, and even ongoing supports, um, and connecting them with resources, especially if they've been never accessed the mental health system before. Um, it's a great uh, community resource and it's a, a statewide trend uh, relative to really looking at how can we support our community.
The other thing that uh, the uh, crisis uh, unit uh, will also be able to provide is a 23-hour observation. So if somebody doesn't need inpatient, but they just need a place to go um, to de-escalate the crisis, have counseling, have immediate uh, assessment, and ongoing connection with services, um, that we'll, we will be able to provide that on site 24-7. The other thing that uh, we will be providing is a crisis residential unit on site, and it is a, um, allows for an individual to stay up to 14 days. Um, and um, it will also be our license in it to also include the SUD population because that is also an unmet need within our community where th individuals are showing up in the ED. Um, so it will be both uh, for uh, the mentally ill population and the SUD population. Um, and we're uh, pretty excited about that. Uh, this is a national trend around, uh, and there's a lot of movement occurring right now at the state level uh, with Governor Whitmer and her administration around. We have to do more at the state to address mental health crisis throughout um, and have a continuum of services. And um, so this is an exciting opportunity for our community to do that. And we want to be able to use millage dollars uh, this next year to support that effort. We also want to continue, obviously, with the services that we've been providing this past year at the millage. We do believe that there is enough funding to be able to expand uh, and provide the crisis continuum, as well as continuing to provide services for the uninsured. Also continuing the supports for uh, the schools that we've been providing, uh, trauma services for youth, continuing the supports for the jails um, that we have here in Jackson, as well as uh, looking at and supporting the ongoing program with Club Life, uh, outstanding results there, um, and as well as um, supporting some of the guardianship uh, services here in Jackson. So now I'll break down um, what the proposed um, uh, budget for 2020 looks like. So when we look at this next year, we will be looking at providing, uh, again, the ongoing mental health jail services. Uh, and here you can see where it broke out. Um, some of it has increased if you looked at the comparison of fiscal year um, uh, 19 when I did my initial budget. Um, some of them did increase, and that's because of the utilization of those services. Some of them uh, decreased slightly because of the utilization, and that would be an example of the mental health services for the uninsured and un underinsured. Um, and the other thing that we're uh, also doing um, is providing, uh, that we did not provide last year, was some supports to the Department on Aging relative to some mental health prevention screenings that they were doing that um, really does an outreach to individuals uh, that are seniors that might, might need to be connected connected with mental health supports. Um, and then um, the uh, other thing that we are looking at doing in Jackson County, and we're quite excited about it, is the uh, crisis intervention team training, and that is uh, in partnership with law enforcement. And it is really looking at a national model for uh, law enforcement being trained around how to uh, interact and connect individuals in partnership with the community mental health um, for individuals that they come across in the community. Uh, we're excited about it because it does. there is an opportunity to do a variety of um, uh, models, if you will. Some uh, communities across Michigan actually have mental health individuals right along with law enforcement when they know that they have a mental health crisis. Other ones, uh, they, um, they don't partner that way, but they do um, have uh, the mobile team meet them at site. Uh, we've had a couple of those happen this past year in partnership with the uh, Jackson City Police, and it's been outstanding. So I'm, I'm guessing I'm running on time. No, okay. Um, so I do want to uh, mention that it is exciting. We have both the uh, city police as well as um, the Jackson uh, County Sheriff's Department has uh, agreed to partner with this type of model. Um, and uh, when I go on to the last slide, the last slide kind of looks at, okay, what was our carryover from last year? Our estimate for fiscal year 2020 relative to the millage, the total that we have budgeted for that I just showed you on the prior slide, and then what our um, or what what the total is, and then what we're budgeting relative to expenditures. And another thing, just to keep in mind that as I have done this past year, is I will, on a quarterly basis, provide updates about 
uh, the utilization of the millage uh, to the county. Um, so now I will leave it up to any questions of the county commissioners. So with the carryover of uh, just under 600,000, mm -hmm. and forgive me because I didn't, I don't have the 2019 budget in front of me. Where are we seeing the increases particularly going to in each department on this breakdown? The, the increase is going towards the enrichment program, okay. the guardianship. So I did increase the guardianship from 20000 to 50000 okay. um, uh, because there's some concern about uh, terminating some community mental health individuals, and so I wanted to cover the cost associated with those individuals. And then um, the increase is relative to the crisis services for the community. Oh, Tony, I'm sorry, over here. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, Tony. I'm having difficulty following these numbers from one budget, what was proposed, what was used, what is proposed for this year, because there are different titles, there are different services. There's, there's nothing... Um, I think I'm going to have to retype this stuff for myself because printing these things out at home, uh, they just don't print out nicely onto a sheet so I can't hold things next to each other and right. go line to line. So I'm having difficulty getting through this. Um, I see that last year the mental health jail services, this year you're proposing 160,000. I gotta scroll all the way back. All right, where'd you go now? Um, come on, open up. I have it up there on the... Oh. That's why I'm having trouble getting through this. Yeah, the reason, if you're asking about the reason for the decrease was last year, I included both the uh, jail services and the CIT training um, for law enforcement, mental health law enforcement training. Uh, it did take some time to work with both the city and with uh, the Jackson County Sheriff's Department to talk about how we wanted to move forward around the implementation of the training um, and what they were agreeable around mental health uh, training. So we did not provide that this past year. And in the, this year's budget, when you look at that last slide, you'll see that I broke it out specifically around CIT. So I took it out of the jail services line and moved it down to the crisis intervention training line. Um. Jail services and law enforcement training in 2019 was a total of 210,000. Um, God, I'm having trouble with this document. Um, I can't read that. Well, I can't scroll between the pages I need. That's also the problem I have is I can't print this and have things laid out so I can cross reference them. Um, why is this not doing that? Oh, come on. This thing's backing up to nonsense. It's also a problem trying to scroll quickly through this thing. It just jumps to a different application. All right. I'll look at rods for a moment. Um, jail services and law enforcement for 2019, 210000 Proposed budget, jail services and law enforcement training. Um, proposed budget at 219, you only spent 89 or 98. Uh, there's a sub note that says note expansion occurred July 2019. Um, in Richmond Center, you had a budget of 300,000, you only spent 188. Um, I'm looking at these things and I'm trying to figure out um, why do you need this much of a millage? You didn't use it before. You've got half a million left over. And so now going from having a budget of, of spending only uh, 1.2 million, now you're saying next year you need 2.7. 
where am I getting confused on these numbers? Can you guide me through this? Yeah, well, I think I'm the important sorry. thing that I tried to make the note of at the very beginning is that, one, um, this is a, a new venture, if you will, for community mental health to have a knowledge. Uh, we did uh, project estimates about where we wanted to focus those efforts. Some of that took some time. Um, like I indicated, the Enrichment Center, I had to procure an RFP. Um, we had to go through a process. We had uh, individuals that are served be a part of the review of selection of an organization to provide those types of services. They did not even get up and going until April. Um, and so it takes some time to in ramp up services, if you will, for a program that's not existed before. And if you look at the utilization of some of those services, like also for the uninsured, you saw an increase over time. And that's because the word gets out that there are services available that were not available before. And so um, the other thing uh, is that we do want to be able to provide uh, services for prices. Uh, we do know that there is a, a needs within our community around the emergency department, around the boarding, around not having alternatives for individuals other than the hospital, not having alternatives for law enforcement other than the hospital, kind of to his point about um, the fact that individuals, you know, law enforcement will have to take them there and sit there and then they end up being discharged and not actually getting admitted or going back to the jail. I mean, there is unmet needs in our community and this does allow us an opportunity with this millage to be flexible and to evaluate it on an annual basis and say, what are the needs? And, you know, I, 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 um, I wish I would have had a, a, a magic ball that would have showed me what I could have seen a year ago right now, but I didn't. And so what we did when we presented, that we presented an initial budget and I've been proposed, and I've been presenting on a quarterly basis about the use of those to this commission throughout the year. Yes, I've been listening to those. Um, what What is the Enrichment Center? So that's the services for individuals who have intellectual developmental disabilities. There are uh, individuals who are usually 26 and older who do not have the ability. So what's difficult to understand, and, and I can't answer the question, why Medicaid allows for individuals with mental health challenges to be able to have a uh, social enrichment type of program uh, where you can um, uh, have natural supports built. You can learn um, how to uh, move around in your community and um, be able to uh, gain employment skills. That's available on the Medicaid side for the mentally ill. When you're uh, intellectually developmentally disabled and you age out of the school system at 26, there is not any services available for you. And one of the things I've heard from parents when I became CEO uh, eight years ago now was that they are struggling with what to do with their disabled adults that have aged out of the school and now they're sitting at home 98% of the time. And their parents, they're working. What, how can we do something as a community to meet an unmet need? And when we went and pursued the millage, this was one of the things that we uh, had earmarked funding for. Um, and they are doing phenomenal things, this Club Life program for this population. All right, so when they're in school, up to age 26, yes. they are provided services that teach them how to function in the community, how to apply for a job and get employment. Once, then once they're over 26, those services aren't provided to them anymore, historically. Not from a social enrichment club like club program like the mentally ill population. No, they do not. It's not available. All right. I, I'm not sure how to ask this question politely. If they are provided those services through the schools beyond high school age, up to age 26, they've been provided those services, and they didn't absorb the benefits of those services. They didn't, for 26 years, they didn't figure out how to function the community, even though they were given these supports. Somehow, <laughs> somehow that system failed, and so now we got to provide more money after they're 26? I wouldn't I say that the system failed. You're talking about individuals, some of them with some extreme disabilities. I would not say that the school system failed them. 
I would say that people need lifelong supports, not just till the age of 26 and then you're done. Okay. I understand that principle. All right. I, I'm going to give you an example, Tony. I witnessed a young lady who no longer could go at age 26 years old to Lyle Torrent. She'd been going every morning from when she was four years old till she was 26. Her parents couldn't convince her that the bus was not going to pick her up anymore. Okay? She has a, a mental deficiency that puts her at that point. She would go out literally every morning and wait for the bus to come by the front of the house. Rain, snow, sleet, better than any uh, person I've ever seen who wanted to go somewhere, but had nowhere to go because she was done with, the, she had timed out, she had aged out. Whereas once we establish this program, she's now attending and now understands mentally that she can get a small job and can get training and can understand. A lot of these people don't, it doesn't click in their minds until after they've done stuff for a really long time, over and over, to understand that they can't do stuff or that they can learn to do stuff. And it's being there when that switch clicks in their mind. And if it means at 29 or 30, then that's what LifeWay is saying they're doing. They're working with these people after they've timed out for services from the ISD. Okay, There's a pot of money that takes care of them when they're this age, and now we've created an organization that's supposed to supplement and help take care of them and train them and make them part of the community, make them function in society at the level that we hope makes them happy and that they can be a, a positive provi provider to society. That's what this does. It's not that they've failed in the school system. It's that it, it, when you're dealing with, with these young people, and when I say young, they could be 35 years old. I, I've worked with them my whole life, and, and they just, they need a spot, and all of a sudden it does. It just clicks. And Mary Beth can tell you that. The, the individual stories right along that, that it happens to. And they need to be outreached and need someone needs to be there. Or they just sit in a chair at home. Okay, instead of even having the opportunity to become a functioning member of society. That's how important this program yeah. is. And this is one of the ones that I'm like most proud of. Because I, I see what it's doing for these individuals. I mean, it's, it's great that this community has been able to provide this. Well, thank you, Jimmy, for that explanation. That helps me. Um, I have very, very limited understanding of of this uh, area of personal help. I'm just trying to read what's here, trying to look at the money that's here, and trying to balance things out. So help. thank you for that explanation. Okay. Um, all right, then the other, back to one of these things that 2019 you had a, 160,000 that went to uh, the jails and to mental health uh, training for officers. Um, you didn't use all of it. Um, now the mental health jail services for 2020 are a standalone item, and I don't see the training of the officers in there. It's on the bottom of that slide up here, CIT training. That's the training for law enforcement. Which slide are you on? The very second to the last slide. Okay, where's the officer training? The crisis intervention team training, the very last item on this slide. Okay, so your crisis intervention team is the... your. Officers fall under that team? Yes, that's many, correct. Are they the totality, total amount of that team, or are there other members on that crisis intervention team? There's going to be five from the Jackson City Police, and there are three from Jackson, uh, the Sheriff's Office. Okay. All right, as I said, I'm having trouble following some of this because the terminology is not the same. And if so it appears to me that some things that were provided before aren't going to be provided now, but thank you for your explanation. 
um, than the I, total than the total financial commitment. If you had five five hundred and eighty four thousand left over last year that you didn't spend, and now you're asking for the millage to be the same dollar amount, the two million one hundred thirty thousand. Um, if you didn't spend it all last year, you're planning on expanding services this year to expand, to spend uh, one million more than you did last year. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I just want to know where the money's, make sure I'm understanding this properly. Thank you. Yes. Mayor Beth, just got a couple of questions for you and a couple of comments. Uh, one is that we have a training consortium for police officers in our county that it's a multi-county actually um, to coordinate training for police officers. You're, with a CIT, you're talking about that's just a specific number of officers from specific agencies. Uh, but if there's training overall for officers, I would encourage you to, to look to potentially uh, offer training to, through the consortium. Uh, if it gets MCOL certified, then the officers get credit for that training, and I think it'd be beneficial. I also look forward to the time when we don't necessarily have to uh, take every person that we come across that may have mental issues to HFA to spend time there. And I think the more that we can do to uh, decrease that, the better off everybody is. Uh, and lastly, back to that number I ask about again, I'm not being critical of the number, I just want to make sure I understand it. So on the third slide, uh, those numbers add up to 302, I think, if I did my math right. Yes, 302 individuals were served, yes. So is that what would be considered to be unique users, or could it be some of the same people, each, because it's a month-by-month -month breakdown, if you know? Yeah, no, they're unique. So it's not like uh, the same person coming back. We took it out, so it's unique, yes. There's unique users. Yeah, there could be, months. right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Darius? Just a couple of quick questions. Um, uh, the My first question, under the enrichment services, Yes. Um, are any of those donated at all? I know we have, uh, I see that your notes here from Jackson Symphony Orchestra, Painting Bowling, or any of those donated? Or do you I mean, I would have to inquire of the Club Life program. They may be getting donations that they wouldn't be reporting to us, um, but I, w I could inquire about that. Okay. Yes. Um, and then this, qu my next question may have already been um, explained to me um, in, in a previous presentation I'm just not seeing the note on yes. it so I do apologize but um, in the jail itself yes. are there any um, services there in house at all yes so we there is um, both uh, in both jails in Jackson huh. um, there is a full-time clinician on site providing crisis intervention as well as uh, outpatient therapy and one of the things that we're also doing with the um, jail is uh, working with them on a Medicaid assisted treatment program but that's not part of the millage Okay. That's a, but just knowing that we're looking at both the SUD piece and the mental health needs of the individuals in the jail. Okay. Now, is this after I'm um, the full-time clinician? Is this like an after-hours thing, or is this like a 24-hour? Right now, it is only during its business hours during the day at this point in time, but they have the availability to access our 24-7 crisis. So if we, they can request somebody to be dispatched from our um, on-call staff. But we don't have somebody there 24-7 at the jail. Okay. Um, and then my last question, um, we are you presented on, on the various schools that were receiving the mental health services, and there were a couple of comments um, on the possibility of some additional schools being added to that list. Um, is there any way that we could have an update on the decision on that? Yes, but I, let me, I would just like to provide some additional information around that is that we've been reaching out to Jackson Public Schools and um, so I, I think it's an ongoing dialogue and education uh, relative to uh, getting them to wanting to engage around the supports that we can provide. So we are doing that. We actually have a... Um, uh, ad hoc committee of our board that's actually just focused specifically on children's services around how we might be able to move the needle on that. Okay. Um, 
And what about the other schools, East Jackson, Vandercook, that were that were mentioned? Do you have individuals that have been reaching out to those as well? Yes. Or has the reciprocation been there, I guess? Yes, I have a specific staff person that that is their role, is to try to build those relationships to engage them in ongoing mental health supports in the schools. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, if there's anything that I can do to, to help facilitate those conversations, I'd be more than happy to. Right, well, thank to you. I appreciate that. that. Thank you. That, that's all. I have nothing okay. further, Mr. Chair. Daniel. Good morning again. Mm -hmm. Just a, a couple of questions. Um, so the first question I had was kind of around the the, um, the CIT training. I'm yes. just curious if that is a a per person cost, or is that just an overall cost? That sixteen thousand is that an overall cost for the group, or is that a per person cost? That it's actually that covering. Um, so the they provided the information, and what I mean by that is the sheriff's office and the city police relative to this training is a pretty in depth. It's five days, um, and to provide the. Uh, estimate of the cost for the backfill for those officers during that time for them to a train. Um, we would be covering the cost of the training ourselves because we will also be sending staff. So it's really about the backfill, then that's the challenge with law enforcement is how do you have an officer, uh, especially one of the uh, models around the ongoing uh, that you uh, referenced, Commissioner Elwell, is about mental health first aid for law enforcement. It's a, it's a long training and the training and the op uh, challenge is how do you backfill for officers that are off the road for eight hours um, and this does allow us an opportunity to do that with the millage dollars um, but that that is what it's for it's to backfill those eight officers if you will is there a plan to um, provide that training to additional officers is this going to be like an ongoing training to try to get them all trained or uh, is there something that could be created because I think you know I know a five-day training is a pretty pretty lengthy training but is there some type of uh, smaller length of time training that we could do an overall training for yeah. for all of the officers right. is that and a that's possibility what through uh, for, through what Dave was talking about with MCOs right. And we're looking at we're looking at uh, several of them. So there is a statewide work group that I sit on um, that is around jail diversion supports, and there are uh, a variety of models that you can implement depending on the county or local law enforcement's needs. It can in range anywhere from a two-hour, a four-hour, eight-hour, or the CIT model. Now that's the ideal model because that really is a partnership. It's not just giving them basic uh, mental health 101, but it's a partnership with the community mental health about what do they do, and it's this team of uh, identified law enforcement that go out when they know that they may be potentially encountering an individual that has a mental health challenge, and how do they do that in partnership with the community mental health. That's what the CIT is. Um, and it really isn't cost effective to actually train an entire um, department on that. Um, it's really a designated group of people that you identify, but there is an opportunity to do some of the other trainings like mental health first aid um, or some of the uh, smaller modules of four two hour trainings. And we're looking at that and we're having discussions with law enforcement about how can we support you. Okay, and then yes. the additional Th thank you for that. The additional question that I had, Mary Beth, was about um, the um, the the uninsured and underinsured. So last year, you said we went from from zero in in eighteen to three hundred and something. Uh, last year, nineteen, we originally budgeted six hundred thousand, uh, came in at like two eighty seven. Mm -hmm. But for twenty twenty, we only budgeted two hundred and forty. Uh, is do you see that population of uninsured and underinsured growing or staying the same? Uh, and and if it does grow, how do we compensate for that with uh, having a, a, a small budget is there room for if that number yeah. exceeds that budget a absolutely there's an ability for me to make the adjustment relative to if we're seeing more of the uninsured it, some of the services you know when I listed that slide that included services that are provided some of them are the crisis services that I'm now shifting over to the crisis line okay so that's why there's some of that decrease okay thank you yep. final round of questions anything Mary Beth, again, thank you for oh, all your you. diligent work and uh, reaching out to this population. Thank you. Good day.
Item 6, non-motorized Jackson County plan. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners and other members. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. I'll well, just speak into the mic. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I didn't realize it made that much of a difference. I apologize. So I'm Tanya De Oliveira. I am from the Region 2 Planning Commission, and I am the project manager for this um, project. And I'm here to provide an update on um, where the project is at, um, at the uh, pleasure of the commission. So as you may recall, um, the Region 2 Planning Commission is working with consultants called the Greenway Collaborative uh, out of Ann Arbor. They happen to be bicycle and pedestrian um, experts in terms of developing facilities and programming uh, for communities. They've done it across the state of Michigan as well as um, other Midwestern states. Uh, they've been doing it for more than 25 years. So uh, who is helping us? We have a project steering committee who are roughly about 20 members. Um, they represent different agencies and constituents across Jackson County. And I'm saying Jackson County as a geography because it also includes the city of Jackson um, and then we've also had a lot of public input along the way as well so we've had a, a robust public input um, not only opportunities but feedback we've actually gotten from the community and I'll talk a little bit about that so the project is basically uh, about to take about a year long it started last winter and it will wrap up um, this winter it will result in a plan for bicycle and pedestrian facilities so that includes things like bike lanes uh, paved shoulders trails sidewalks um, a network um, um, for Jackson County as well as programming elements for the uh, for the county and the city um, as well as villages and townships to consider as well I will also say if anybody has any questions feel free to um, uh, let somebody know and I and I will happy to address them or if you pr uh, pr uh, prefer to wait that is fine for me as well oops so I believe the last time this group may um, have heard something about this project formerly was right when we were beginning the spring round of public engagement. Um, that was quite a success. We went out to 10 communities across the county, and that would um, be the consultants who led the, the uh, public input. We had opportunities. There was uh, 10 different meetings. They were about two hours each. Um, I think we had um, a roughly... Well, we had over 100 people participate in the public meetings. We also had an online engagement. So there's a project website. And over the course of the, um, the spring public engagement, there was a specific platform where people could participate. The map kind of in the bottom corner there with um, looks like a bunch of little quotes. Uh, that was just a snapshot of what the public engagement port a portion of the website look like for our spring public engagement um, and then we also had uh, at the public meetings people come out and um, tell us their ideas in the spring the consultants said um, let's just go out and hear what people's thoughts were kind of you know what are your ideas start with a blank slate essentially we had a map um, either the county or the local communities and say just tell us your ideas and people had a lot of positive feedback in terms of what they wanted to see in the, their communities uh, for bicycle and pedestrian um, projects. Then over the summer, the consultants took the public feedback they received in the spring, along with the homework they had done over the course of last winter in terms of gathering information on, on Jackson that includes things like vulnerable, uh, vulnerable populations, maybe don't have access to uh, transportation, land use, um, environmental uh, issues, uh, those kinds of pieces of information, and then they developed an actual network a draft network, I should say. Then in the fall, um, the consultants went back out to the public. They had another 10 meetings. They had another um, online uh, engagement piece on the website. And they had asked the public, what did we, uh, from what we heard from you guys in the spring, this is the network we developed. What are your thoughts? And uh, the public um, told the consultants whether they got right, what they got wrong, what they needed tweaking. And what I want to show you here um, on this next screen is just sort of a working document piece the consultants put together um, after the fall public engagement. Um, okay, so the, just to kind of help you orient what this map is showing you just at a high level, the pieces of information that are in red, so that's either the red lines or the um, text in red boxes. That is what the public told the consultants that they would like to see as a priority, what they want done first. <laughs> There's a lot of red on the map, um, which is positive again, right? We we did our due diligence when we um, advertised this. We put it on websites. We put it, uh, we asked the newspapers to run some um, ads. 
um, I also believe there were some local um, newspapers that did some stories on this. I also want to know that uh, the radio stations advertised this as well as um, WLNS out of Lansing happened just to cover that there's public meetings going on. So there was certainly a lot of opportunity for people to know about the project. So, sorry, getting back to the map, the blue, um, either the lines or the boxes in white, um, the blue shows what maybe people thought was less important or a lower priority. And then the information that was in black is just things that um, people were saying that needed uh, tweaking or updating, the consultants didn't get quite right. The numbers that you happen to see, they, uh, there's another document that corresponding, I think there's like over 100 comments, about what these individual like lines or segments, what is actually happening, that's in a different document. And then all the background pieces of information are maybe the, the draft uh, network that the consultants put together. And again, this is just a county map. There's one of these for every individual community, as well as the city of Jackson. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of work that the consultants did in terms of gathering the public input, making sense of it, and trying to boil it down to start creating something. So what's, this, what's that to say is that what the consultants have been doing from the fall until now is that they've been taking this information and they've been beginning to develop um, a final draft network as well as a final planning document to help kind of explain and provide a roadmap of what the uh, county might consider implementing in terms of bicycle and pedestrian facilities for the next 5, 10, and maybe even 20 years. So this is um, a draft of what the regional county network looks like at this time. Um, this is just, again, just a draft. Um, let me just kind of walk you through what the different colors um, show. So in red, what it shows is the, the trails, essentially, the, the backbone or priority trails that would crisscross the, the county. Um, the next color is yellow or orange. Uh, and those are gravel roads. Um, again, the public has asked for gravel road trails specifically will be either designed or maintained for bicycle and pedestrian um, travel, traffic, recreation, people to enjoy gravel road riding. It's an actual part of the, the bicycling community. And then the, um, the green line, sorry, I keep looking because this is not showing up the true color in the screen in front of me. The green line, are showing where um, perhaps Jackson County Department of Transportation could focus on uh, maintaining paved shoulders specifically for the public who would like to either bike or walk or needs to bike and walk um, across the county. And then the very sort of light pink, it just happens to show where the Iron Bell and the Great Lakes to Lake Trail is. And if just to diverge from this map for just a moment, um, for those that may not be aware of what the Iron Bell Trail is, this is a map. Um, this, there's two trails and they go from Ironwood, Michigan, up in the um, Upper Peninsula, down to um, Bell Isle, down by Detroit. And they are ways for people to bike and walk across the entire state of Michigan. This trail isn't necessarily completely um, um, installed yet or completed. However, this is the grand vision. You can kind of see where Jackson is. Um, and as you may know, there's actually a good portion of the trail in Jackson done. And that's just to highlight and show that when we're talking about biking and walking and making investments in our community, we're not just thinking about the impacts for our community, but perhaps those that could be felt statewide from either a travel or economic development standpoint. So going back to this. So this is uh, the draft county network that the consultants have um, completed at this time. There's also one of these kind of... Um, maps with more detailed information, sometimes d as down as detailed as to what kind of crosswalks should be happening in places like Springport, Parma, Grass Lake, um, Concord, um, the Brooklyn area, um, and, and those kinds of communities. And that information will be more forthcoming. The uh, consultants have not completed all of those yet. Um, yes. Or, yep. Okay. Just looking at the map. Yes. That more down by the Brooklyn and Norville Township area. I see a couple that are like dots and and the and the lines not connected like it is in the rest of the county. Is that a misprint or is So my understanding of what that is showing is that perhaps instead of just recognizing that there are maybe some um land um owners who uh Either landowners or there's uh, or the the the, uh, the geography maybe there's like a, you know a big water um that's, a big water sort of uh, imp impediment. Um, the, the connection, instead of it being like a nice trail, you know, following the red, you would have to go from a trail to a gravel road back up to a trail. So you could actually follow it 
even if it was like in black and white, it would make a connection. But it just doesn't maybe, rec it recognizes that perhaps there's some work to be done, that there wasn't a foregone conclusion. Um, you know, maybe some, pub um, some landowners came to the public meeting and said, we're not really interested in having the trail in our backyard. And the consultants are recognizing and honoring that there's something to be you know, said there about you know, what people may or may not be interested in at this time. There, there's an, another question. Yeah. I just wanted to comment that I think part of that you see, Corey, is what's called a spirit trail. It, it runs from what's the old railroad grade, which is that north-south line you see along 127, and then uh, that's picked up with an actual trail on the west end of Clark Lake and heads down to Ocean Beach Road and around, and I think the rest of it is proposed, what they're talking about doing uh, around Lake Columbia into Brooklyn probably. So what I can also clarify is that this is what a regional network would look like when there's all the money in the sky, everybody loves biking and walking, and kumbaya, you know, you know, wonderful, wonderful. What this doesn't recognize is what the, um, this map right here, though the plan does in and of itself, doesn't recognize what the existing uh, bicycle and walking you know, trail facilities are in the county versus those that are planned. So just kind of understand there's a nuance here in this picture that you're seeing. And of course, when we're talking about a perfect world that's a world that would, doesn't necessarily exist but how um, we're trying to get a roadmap of how we could actually get there if a community all of its members um, you know are interested in developing this over a number of years um, tens years if not decades so what are the next steps I just want to talk briefly about that um, so the next steps is, so this is February by the end of March we should have a completed planning document so um, over the next two months, we'll have actually opportunities for engagement for final review of the final draft plan. Um, what will that will look like is that um, before the final draft plan kind of comes out, um, the Jackson County Department of Transportation, um, as well as the city and county parks, have asked for just to kind of look at the maps of the network preliminarily so they can be comfortable, the staff can be comfortable with what is being proposed before it goes out so that way they can entertain any questions that might come out. Um, after the, uh, they've had just a preliminary chance to review the, the maps, the steering committee will then look at the, the project, uh, that means the maps of the network as well as the planning document, you know, let the consultants know what needs to be changed, um, I'll give them the thumbs up. Then there'll be an opportunity for um, the uh, plan and the final draft plan to go public. And that would be an opportunity for yourselves as well as any members of the public to review the plan and um, you know put any f in final last uh, comments. This will be the third opportunity for public input. So I hope um, just the idea that the public has had an ample opportunities for public input has been um, you know recognized through this planning process. And then um, you know, the plan will be sort of done. The, the, the plan itself will be done at the end of March. However, then the real work gets down to being done, and that's the adoption process of the plan th at the county level, at the city level, as well as the villages and townships. And once the plan is adopted, then um, county and city uh, departments can start um, working towards implementing the recommendations of the plan and actually realizing um, this planning process and having us have nice bikes, bike lanes, trails, and sidewalks in the community that were fully vetted through the public process. Um, and that will happen in, like, in about the next six months to a year, roughly speaking, the approval and adoption process. So that's where the, the plan is now. Uh, just lastly, as I'll leave this slide up, as I'm happy to take questions. Here's the project website. A lot of the project documents that have been, uh, the, the presentations that have been given to the steering committee are available there, as well as a lot of the maps the consultants have put together kind of as working documents along the way. They're very, it's a very transparent website, so please feel free to visit that if anybody has any questions, and I'm, I'm happy to entertain any other questions at this time. Tony? Thanks for this uh, presentation. Um, I, was, I read all of the public comments that were on the map. Um, just because a public comment is made doesn't necessarily mean we have to incorporate it. Um, connection from trail to breweries. <laughs> Iron Bark 127 Brewery. Um, I guess I question how valid that is. Do we want to link our bike paths, our walking paths to uh, breweries? Um, and how do you decide which one? Uh, or all of them? 
going to connect them to breweries, going to connect them to bars in town. Um, funded to hire acquisition specialists to secure easements on abandoned rail corridors under private ownership. Yeah, some of these abandoned rail corridors uh, logically would make some nice uh, trails. But if they're under private ownership, you may not get the owners to agree to... That's right. That's correct. And I, I would never support private land condem condem condemnation sure. to, uh, for a bike path or a walking path. Uh, I would never support that. Um, and would you need to hire a specialist to do that? You don't have staff already that have those capabilities? So these are just the reflection of what the public has said. This does not indicate that there is going to be action taken on it. It's more or less just comments. Let me just go back for those. Everybody can kind of see. Um, I'm assuming you're reading from this map. Is this correct? Okay. Yeah, so this is just comments that were collected and at the countywide level and the, for the consultants to digest and to take in consideration. Um, I will say that they have strongly agreed with your comment in terms of, you know, if there's a, a private landowner who's not comfortable, we're not interested in making, you know, in fighting that fight. Let's go around and try to figure out if there's a better way. If over through that process, can, um, a landowner has decided to change their mind and they want to join back in the conversation, you know, that's great. But the consultants would agree, and I think you would see in the recommendations that will be coming out in the final draft plan, wouldn't say, hey, let's just, you know, take a project and ram it through someone's backyard. You know, that's not an appropriate way to, to do this. Plus, it doesn't make good sense in terms of a long-term relationship and building trust between... Um, um, you know, private landowner and the government. So absolutely. And I think what the consultants here are just showing is that, you know, when people have come out to these essentially 20 public meetings as well as the public online engagement, the record, the, the, what they're doing is they're writing this down to reflect what they've heard and just have the opportunity for the public to say, yes, you've, you've heard this. That's why along with public... Um, public engagement, the consultants did their homework back last winter and they're continuing to use that in terms of understanding what are the, the, the barriers or um, the opportunities related to what land use says, what are the opportunities and um, barriers related to other planning processes like recreation planning, um, other populations, just kind of understanding that there's more to this than just because one person says something, it's going to happen. However, what it is interesting to show is that if there's um, a public comments that are kind of coming back again and again over the course of time that kind of keep bubbling up, um, and there's more than one comment, there's a number of comments about a particular topic, that's worth considering and maybe diving in further. And again, that's why we've asked the consultants to come on and board and to, to do this. We're not doing it our, ourselves here, you know, either the county, region two, or the city, we're asking consultants to do this because essentially, um, when the consultants have put together a final draft plan, we get to look at it and say, well, we appreciate this, but let's let's change this or let's tweak it. So I would invite you when there's uh, when the opportunity comes out for the final draft plan to review it, to do that. And through that, I, will, I believe I've sent out emails to the group here. If there's comments, please feel free to pass them back to me or directly to the consultant, and I can pass them on to the consultant as well. Thank you. Any other comments? Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Ready, Zoe? Yes. Adverse Childhood ex uh, Experiences, DHS, Zoe Lyons, Director. Can you pull up my... Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me back, and I apologize for not being here as scheduled in January. Um, I also appreciate the bike and walk information in between the two very heavy topics of mental health and uh, childhood trauma. So certainly being out in the fresh air helps with uh, dealing with some of our harder to handle topics. Um, so. Our adverse childhood experience, this is just sort of um, a quick 
taste of what we are presenting around the community and around the state. When I say we, uh, myself and Dr. Bob Powell from Family Service and Children's Aid are master trainers that were trained in from the My ACE initiative over two years ago. And we um, have done over 70 presentations to over 4,000 people around adverse childhood experiences. So we're gonna give you just a little bit of information about what they are, how they affect the world around us, and um, and I'll share with you a little bit about who we've trained in, in the community here, and then answer any questions that you might have. Um, so the ACE study actually occurred in the mid-1990s, so we are actually coming up on 30 years since the ACE, original ACE study took place. It has been replicated uh, many times with the same um, information coming out of uh, additional studies, so um, it remains um, accurate and uh, good information today. It was the largest study of its kind at the time. Um, Kaiser Permanente, if you think of um, uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Michigan. So Kaiser Permanente is the population that they uh, used for the study. And um, the study was a, a bunch of questions about potential different traumas were sent out to 46,000 participants. 17,000 returned the questionnaire. And so the ACE study is based on those 17,000 uh, survey responses. And then additional information about those participants and their long-term health. Um, it examines past abuse, family dysfunction, and then current health status to come up with, um, with the results of the ACE study. So um, the 10, the ACE questionnaire, and I did pass out handouts that look just like this little um, piece on the right here. Um, the ACE questionnaire has 10 questions. The questions um, leave the person who answers the questions with an ACE score of 0 to 10. And they are around physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse, um, alcohol or drug use in the home, um, an incarcerated household member, so whether someone spent time in jail or prison, um, someone who has mental health issues that is in your home when you were a child, a mother treated violently. So back in 1996 when they were doing this study, the domestic violence was very focused on mothers. Domestic violence now we know, uh, we know men can be abused. We know that in same-sex uh, relationships there can be domestic violence. Um, but certainly there is something very um, specifically hurtful when a child watches their mother being harmed. Um, having parents who are uh, separated or divorced and then emotional or physical neglect are the 10 ACEs. Um, again, I gave you this questionnaire so that you can take a look at it and get an idea of um, where you might fall or people that you uh, know and love might fall in terms of the ACE um, of your ACE score. They do fall into household dysfunction and then abuse and neglect, so you can sort of separate them out uh, five and five in that way. So of the 17,000 ACE study participants, 36% um, had zero ACEs, which when you sort of look at that, you think, great, that's the largest number uh, um, in terms of, um, of anywhere from 0 to 10, but that also means that over 60% of our population have experienced ACEs. And again, I want to remind you about the population of this study. So again, if you equate it to a Blue Cross and Blue Shield population in Michigan, what we know about the the participants in the study is that the vast majority of them were white, middle class, had some college education, and were employed. What we also know about how trauma is experienced in our world is that if you don't fall into those categories, you are um, likely to have experienced trauma at higher rates. So when you add in our people of color, our LGBTQ population, people who live in poverty, you start to see how our, um, our ACE numbers are likely higher than 60%, probably closer to 80, 85% in our population. And you can really start to see how that affects our community. In terms of um, ACE scores, you, uh, they really look at one, two, three, and then four or more. 
So long-term health outcomes from a, an ACE score of four, five, and six, all the way up to 10, tend to be about the same. And they um, are not very good if you have an ACE score of four or more. Um, this just gives you a sort of breakdown of how many in the population um, fell under each type of abuse or neglect. So I think that's self-explanatory, so I'll just move on in the impact of time. Um, so these are some of the things that are results of uh, high ACE scores in our population. So they can affect our behaviors. They can affect our, uh, um, our addictions, such as drug use and alcoholism and smoking. They can cause us to miss work. So it can have an effect on our employment. And then it really can have uh, a strong effects on our physical and mental health. So anything from um, severe obesity and diabetes to uh, stroke and uh, heart disease, um, mental health issues, and suicide attempts. So no, you I, can, yes. I believe. Yeah. Sorry. Had a question. It's okay. I just got to go back okay. one, one slide if we could. Sure. And I'm just curious. 20%, that's, boy, I, I never would have guessed that on sexual mm -hmm. abuse. But what's the sample population, uh, first of all, the number of people that participated, and are they just random people, or? So they were, they were um, in ca the Kaiser Permanente health care system at, at, out of California back in the mid-1990s was the original population. Oh, so this isn't relevant to Jackson County, this is a, a national thing. This is, it's a national study, and it. Um, but I can tell you in our work that we've done, it is very relevant to Jackson okay. County, and, well, and in line with it. I just meant... The study was done yeah. in California, correct. Okay. Um, okay, so here's what we know about ACE scores. The more... The more ACEs that you have, the higher your risk for negative um, health and social outcomes. So those things that we talked about on this page in terms of um, behavior and physical and mental health, the higher your ACE score, the more likely you are to suffer those outcomes. Um, so in a dose response relationship, as that goes up, so do your negative health outcomes. So they influence us over a lifetime as well. So obviously, uh, adverse childhood experiences can start at birth. What we also know, the newest science actually in the last couple of years is related to epigenetics. And it tells us that actually trauma that, we, that our predecessors, our parents and our grandparents have experienced is passed down through us in our, in, through our DNA. So, um, so this starts to have um, a, an effect in maybe, maybe I have not experienced something myself as a, a child, but if my mother or my father was abused or neglected and suffered um, at the hands of their own parents, I may still have some responses and some negative health comes as a result of that. So it actually becomes um, a uh, intergenerational response as well. Um, and it can really end up um, in early death. So people with high ACE scores, their life expectancy can be decreased by up to 20 years. And this shows how it affects our society. So there's that life expectancy on the le left-hand side at um, uh, higher ACEs, you decrease your life expectancy. On the right is the economic toll. So you can see that 3.9 billion in criminal justice costs, 4.4 billion in child welfare, um, which is in large part why I'm here, because as you know, I'm the director at the Department of Health and Human Services, and we do child welfare. Um, special education costs, health care costs, and um, at the bottom, 83.5 billion in productivity loss. So that's our businesses. That's those folks who can't go to work because they're ill, they're, they have social issues that keep them from uh, learning and being trained, um, and those are su really high costs for our community as well. Um, this is an example of a Washington classroom. Washington State uh, is a little bit ahead of us in terms of ACE work in their communities, but what you can see in an average uh, high school classroom is that um, only six students out of 30 had zero ACEs. So it's really in line with what we're seeing um, in terms of the ACE score as well. And you had um, 10 students that had ACE scores of four or higher just within one classroom. 
So when you think about how ACEs affect our social um, and emotional functioning, and you think about what teachers are experiencing when they have 10 students potentially in their classrooms that have high ACE scores, you can start to see how this affects our schools as well. So it's not all bad news. The reason that we are out here doing these presentations is that we want folks to know there are ways to build resilience to this trauma that children experience and to um, create communities that help build up stronger children. Um, and keep in mind, all of us used to be children. <laughs> So we're not only talking about kids who are under 18 right now, we are actually talking about all of the adults in our communities that this affects as well. So it's, this is a problem for all of us. Um, so these, uh, we're going to talk about a few ways that we can really build things up. I will tell you the number one thing that all of the experts across the, the world talk about in terms of balancing and having an effect on children who have experienced trauma is this middle bucket here, attachment and belonging. And it is my number one message to the people that I train everywhere and that I talk to on the streets. Um, and that is a strong, safe, caring adult in the life of a child can make all the difference in the world. It's also one of the reasons that we have really focused on educators because teachers are with our children so often. Um, but anyone in the community, whether you're a church member, a neighbor, a family member, anyone can be that strong, safe adult for a child and make a difference. Um, the other thing under capability is teaching kids um, skills. We need to teach them self-regulation. So when they start feeling upset, we need to give them skills for how to settle themselves down so that we're not constantly in an anger management situation. Um, we need to ta teach them um, positive self-view and self-efficacy. Um, and I just recently read an article that said chores are very good for children who have experienced ACEs. It gives them this um, something to do. You're teaching them a skill. And then when they do it successfully, you're teaching them self-efficacy. So it's a really great way to build resilience. Um, and then on the right, community culture and spirituality. This is where, again, we come in as a community. We come together in our faith communities. In Jackson, we have a great Jackson Collaborative Network where folks are constantly coming together in the betterment of our community. And all of this work that we do as a community helps build up the community in a way that builds up our children and our families. Some very sort of um, concrete things that we can also do to um, help both adults and children who have experienced ACEs is um, increase, so these are sort of resilience factor, factors that make a difference, increase feelings of uh, hope, emotional support, and hope. So um, any way that you can do that by being a caring adult or a caring neighbor are ways that cause people to um, sort of stand up uh, uh, even though they've experienced trauma. Having two or more people who help, and this is concrete help. So um, we have lots of people, even in our own community, who we, if we said, who could you go to if you needed a gallon of milk, they wouldn't have someone. Who would you go to if you had two children and one had to go to the emergency room because they had a high fever? Who would watch the other child? They wouldn't know. If we can help people make those connections so that the, everyone has at least two people that they could go to, we are going to build up community and build up resilience to our traumas. Community reciprocity is watching out for each other. So when we build up our neighborhoods to watch out for kids in our neighborhoods, we are building community reciprocity. Uh, we sort of talk about Bob and I when we were kids, which was a while ago. Uh, you know, when the street lights came on, you had to go home. Um, if I did something naughty between my house and my friend's house down the street, my mom probably already knew by the time I got home because they, you know, there were phone calls happening. Now there's sort of this uh, stay back, don't get involved, and, and that doesn't help us as a community. Um, and then social bridging is helping people reach outside their social circle for the help that they need. So um, I always, we always ask our classes, who knows about what 211 is? You would be, you all know what 211 is? Okay. You would be surprised. Really? Really? All right. Well, let's do it. 211 is the, um, the emergency service equivalent to 911. 
So if I have a, a medical or a, a criminal justice emergency, I'm calling 911. If I need a doctor and I don't know where to go, or um, food or housing and I don't know where to go for it, I just can call 211 and they will help me navigate through what's available in our community to find something for me. And then I reach out and make those connections. Um, so, so social bridging and helping people get the help they need also builds up their abilities to resist um, the effects of trauma. Um, again, here, so you can sort of see what it, what it costs us. Abuse and neglect being five of those types of ACEs, and then really the other five types of ACEs also fall into the, the child welfare world. Um, so non-fatal child maltreatment has an average lifetime cost of $210,000 per victim. And if you compare that to type 2 diabetes, which is actually less than that at $181,000, um, you can start to, again, see the cost to our community just in monetary costs, let alone the emotional costs. I put some um, resources on here for you in case you're interested in learning more. Um, you can also pull up TED Talks and there's all kinds of really simple um, information that you can get online around ACEs. Um, I will tell you that um, we offer free sessions for ACEs um, in our community. because We sign on the dotted line to do this free because we believe in it 100%. Um, we do them once a month, and you can sign up through the nonprofit network. Those are all day sessions. That's why I tell you this is just a bite. Um, we talk about how the brain is affected by trauma. We talk more about ACEs, and we talk more about resilience. And then we also take time during that those classes and build strategies as a community. So how many times have you been to a training, and it's really interesting while you're there, but then you leave and you go on your day, right, your work? You, yeah, that was great. We want people leaving that session with how it's going to be different the minute you walk out that door. And so we've spent a lot of time working with folks on individual strategies and strategies within their buildings as well. Um, and then lastly, I will just let you know, um, sort of along the lines of the conversations with Mary Beth earlier, um, of those 70 plus trainings that we've done in the community. Um, I'll let you know some of the places that we've done them. Um, we have trained all of these school districts. Jackson Public Schools at all levels, elementary, middle school, and high school. Uh, Northwest Schools at all levels, although a very short version. Some of our Jackson Public Schools got all day classes. Um, Western Schools, Hanover, East Jackson. Uh, we went to East Jackson on uh, Martin Luther King Day on my day off and did a three hour session for the teachers in East Jackson. Um, da Vinci has been trained. Columbia, while they haven't necessarily gotten ACEs, has gotten a lot of um, still trauma informed training and uh, a lot of work done out there. We've trained Jackson College, all of ABC Academy, so our daycare providers. Um, all of Jackson Police Department were trained last um, June. Um, and then we've trained businesses. So we've trained um, the Southeast Human Resource um, uh, Group had us come in, Henry Ford Allegiance Health, um, and we're planning to go to uh, Michigan Works and do Michigan Works both locally, and then we're also doing the statewide group of Michigan Works as well. So that's just a, a little bit about who we've um, done the training for so far. And, um, and again, our, our real goal is to get this out to everyone who, can, who will listen. Daniel. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, thank you for this uh, great information. I just have one question. If you can um, provide to uh, the, the administrator or chairman um, the schedule of available trainings mm -hmm. and then the link for us to be able to sign up you if bet. interested. I will do that. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Sorry, I thank you. I appreciate you coming here and doing this for us. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you all in my classes. <laughs> Any other, <clears throat> any other items to come before the board? Seeing none, any public comment? Any public comment? 
Seeing none, Commissioner comments. If you have questions from anything that was discussed today that comes up later on, please get with Deborah or Christopher so we can share them with all commissioners when we receive the answers back. Please. We are adjourned.